Welcome to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. I'm Amanda. And I'm Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, Agronomy and Farm Management listeners, Amanda here. Today's podcast is part two of our two-part series with the Ag Law Team. Last week, we covered hemp and the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. If you haven't listened to part one yet, we encourage you to pause and jump back to that one first. Then come back and listen to part two as we get into solar leasing and the Roundup cases. All right, back to the show. So let's talk about the thing that we've been hoping we'll get more of, and that's sunshine. Yeah. And so you've been saying there's a lot of interest growing in leasing ground for solar. Yes. Solar farms, is that the correct term to use for those? It is. It is. Yep. And when we talk about solar farms, we're really talking about those large scale uh, solar energy developments that are regulated. So that means they have to be over 50 megawatts um, capable of producing that much energy. If they get to that level, they're regulated. Uh, through the PUCO and the Ohio uh, Power Siding, Ohio Power Siding Board. So there's a number of those going on now. I remember when Eric Romick, who's our energy uh, field specialist in Ohio, a number of years ago wanted to talk to me about solar leasing, and I said, um, I don't know, Eric, you know, there was a lot going on with shale and wind, and really, solar in Ohio? But yeah. yes, it's here. Yeah, it's amazing. Are you seeing this in other states around the Midwest? Yes, we were. um, Evan and I did a webinar a couple of weeks ago for Eric with states from all across the country Mm -hmm. um, that are dealing with Mm -hmm. solar. And so apparently the technology has improved immensely in the last decade or so and has made collecting solar energy more efficient and less costly than it used to be. And Eric could tell you what those numbers are, how much it's decreased. I can't recall the numbers, but it's become more economically viable. And then there was a lot of, you know, government subsidy assistance and encouragement and incentives for for renewable energy. So that's affected it as well. So, yeah, we're seeing a lot of interest in solar farming. So I think the biggest thing here for landowners is that these are really long-term leases, and that's a, something you really need to consider when you think about tying your land up for 25, 30 years. And you guys have been looking at some of those leases. You've heard a lot about what's going on around the state. Um, so what are some components of that, and what are important things that they should consider if they get approached? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's pretty interesting to see what some of these look like. Uh, and again, Eric has some great photographs. And we'll be doing a, a solar leasing 101 meeting here in a few weeks, and he'll be sharing that, what this large-scale solar energy production actually looks like on the land. You're right, it takes land out of production for some maybe as short as 20 years, but it sounds like 30 is more common, yeah. right? Plus the option periods and then mm. the options to renew. So it could be 35 years or more yeah. that that land is out of production. And uh, I was curious, as I mentioned before, to see how much land has been taken out of production in Ohio. And right now with the six approved wind farm or solar farms and the three that are pending approval. Uh, I added up the acreage, 12,300 acres of ag land Mm -hmm. will be taken out of production for for those. So these are large developments. The largest one was 3,300 acres for one solar development. I think that one was in Hardin County. Um, So is it mostly taking up ag land or is it, it is actually the total for uses? all of them was 16,000 okay. acres and of that um, over 12,000 of it was was classified in their application they have to say how much of this is mm-hmm. ag land so uh, 12,300 acres uh, came in as ag land that will be used for the solar facilities and this is probably flat ground that they're interested in? Well, or can it have some the, slope to it? Uh, I think they try to go flat, but they can adjust. Um, 
Yeah, they can adjust. I was asking Eric about that as well. Uh, and some of the areas where they're putting them, it's not completely flat. So a little okay. bit, a little bit of hilly. In fact, there's some in Highland County, um, Vinton County, okay. Brown. So some of those terrains are a little, uh, a little less flat than mm -hmm. Hardin County, for instance. <laughs> yeah. But they can, they can adjust. Again, the technology. You know, these panels can move uh, much more than they used to be able to, and they can track the sun. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> but anyway, let's talk about some of the considerations that a landowner should have if thinking about that. My first, I'll have Evan talk more about the lease itself, but um, my first consideration is just thinking about how it fits into the overall plan for the farm, mm -hmm. um, including estate plans and farm transition plans, because as you said, Amanda, they're taking this land out for 30 years. Mm -hmm. so. If you've got a next generation coming in, how does this now affect that? Uh, because it's hard to do much else other than the solar panels. Yeah. They're, they're playing around right now with maybe hay. Uh, mm -hmm. Some allow sheep, but they don't like goats or cattle because they can <laughs> harm the, the uh, facilities. The sheep apparently leave it alone. But once it's solar, there's not a whole lot more you can do with it. So if you've got, you know, transition plans that are planning to hand things down to the next generation and then suddenly you lease a big portion or all of the farm out for solar, what does that mean uh, for the family and the farm business? But there's a lot of money, so <laughs> some of the numbers we're hearing look pretty appealing and especially when you can't even get a crop in the ground these right. days and prices tanking the way they have um, these can be they can appear to be lucrative right now uh, we've heard numbers anywhere from what are the numbers 700 to 1200 yeah or more in per some cases acre. yeah for the once you get into the solar lease mm -hmm. itself yes and then before that, so that would be per acre per year. Um, but before that, there's an option period, and those numbers are smaller. They're 20 to 50, I think we've heard, yeah. plus a, a, a signing type bonus mm -hmm. that can be several thousand or more. 10,000 was the highest I've heard on that. So they look kind of lucrative, don't they, yeah. right now, financially. Uh, but let's talk about some of the leasing. Um, issues that that we should alert folks to if they are thinking about this yeah so we've had a chance to review a handful of leases at this point um, a lot of solar energy developers um, don't want their leases getting out so some <laughs> we we think we have a fair representation but it is kind of hard to tell so that's kind of the first um, wall we run up against is these confidentiality clauses Companies don't want their, what they deem proprietary information getting out, and they also don't want landowners talking about what they're getting paid. So they include these as early as the like mm -hmm. initial option letters where they're just talking about feasibility studies. Um, so farmers want to make sure that they, they read those to see what the extents are, if there are any exceptions and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but then we also look to see like what the durations are and how long they go and what the phases are. So we talked a little bit about how there's the option period that actually starts before the actual term. So the term is what we're talking about with the 20 to 30 years and whatnot, but the option would be a, a year or two even before that um, that you're adding on. And then at the end, a lot of these have um, options to renew that are pretty much if the solar energy developer decides I want to stay on for five more years, I want to stay on for 10 more years, they're allowed to do that. Um, so you could be looking at an even longer contract. And with a contract of that length, there are a lot of things you want to be thinking about before signing on the dotted line. Some of those things are like, what rights are you giving away and what rights are you retaining? Um, so really these solar leases include a lot of easements. So we have construction easements, we have access easements, and in those access easements, basically the landowner is saying, I'm giving you the right to cross my land, whether or not this will be under a solar panel one day so that you can access your solar facilities. So it can be an even bigger 
um, easement than the farmland owner might be expecting. So they'll want to make sure that that's, that's very clear. That can be whether through the language or through maps, um, but then we also have like transmission easements and we have solar easements, which basically are the farmland owner can't do anything that would block sunlight. Um, so the, the landowner needs to understand what kind of rights are being given These out. easements are kind of tricky in this one because we're accustomed to seeing easements as separate documents that mm. yeah. that we would review and sign. And, you know, a landowner would see that. Oh, it says it's an easement. It looks like an easement. But when we're talking about solar lease, they're kind of blended right into the mm. lease. And so I, I worry that it's not real clear yeah. uh, that it's actually an easement that they're entering into if they sign the lease. It's a little bit tricky the way that it's done. Kind of different, but yeah. Yeah. So that kind of highlights the value of having an attorney involved in the process and reviewing exactly what's going on in in that lease and understanding some of that language. Yeah. Another concern is, you know, we mentioned you're taking that land out of ag production, so we have CAUV issues. And once it goes to solar, it's not going to continue to qualify for CAUV, and there's going to be a recoupment penalty. Mm -hmm. That recoupment penalty is the savings for the last three years. So, you know, if you're looking really? at a thousand dollar or a thousand acre farm that's going to convert to solar, they're going to have to pay that recoupment fee of what they saved by being in CAUV versus what they would have paid had it not been in CAUV for the last three years. That'll have to be paid to the county. So that's something that needs to be in the lease to make sure that the developer is the one who pays that yeah. or that you're compensated as the landowner for the loss of that and that penalty. Yeah, and some of those areas that could be huge, right? It could be, yeah. <laughs> yep. But then we also, we, we see the, that issue at the beginning and then we see it again at the end. What's the solar energy developer gonna do to help get the land back to a condition where it can qualify for CAUV. Um, so we, we look at their cleanup terms fairly closely because when we see some of these projects going in, we're talking about thousands of stakes being driven into the ground mm -hmm. and basically new ditches being dug into the ground to lay all this ground wire. And that's miles and miles of wire that's going into the ground, destroying tiling. So mm -hmm. The, the cleanup terms need to be very clear to what condition the land needs to be returned to, whether foundations have to be all the way removed. Um, some of the leases I've read, they, the solar energy developers only agree to basically go down to like three feet deep and they don't mention tiling. Um, so yeah. the farmer needs to have this reviewed so that they understand what the land will look like at the end and how long it's gonna take to get it back into a usable condition for ag purposes. Right. Yeah, especially if this is some of the prime farm ground, it could drastically alter your yields. It could. You know. yeah. It could. yeah, I was just thinking about all of the above ground infrastructure. Yeah. My mind hadn't even made it to thinking about all of the underground infrastructure. Potential. I, mean, I was kind yeah. of thinking about compaction, but just soil yeah. landscape changes. Yeah. That's a lot of things to be considering. These, I was so surprised to see some pictures of the cabling and bundling. There, a lot, a lot of wire under there. You talk about cables. that amount of energy that they're having to move away from those panels. Right, right. It's a so, lot of infrastructure. And that is an important term. Then is cleanup at the end of the period. But then you have, you have to worry about whether that company will even be there to clean it up. Yeah. Right? So doing some due diligence and really investigating the developer and how credible um, and, and how well off that developer is because if they go out, what happens to that infrastructure? You know, there are going to be some terms in there about you know, who they can assign the lease to, but there's definitely some homework to be done there on who you're dealing with. Yeah, because some of these have already changed hands, you know, from when they first approached the farmer to mm -hmm. maybe initial lease write-up the company's already been sold so that's I, a good point i kind of thought of something while you guys were talking is there an average or a set amount of acres that they'll make the lease for and they won't do anything under that or are there smaller and larger leases oh, i would imagine once they kind of know an area they want to go into and have an idea of the scale of the project then they might try to 
go to as few landowners as possible or one. Uh, but as I said, some of these are 3,000 acres, so it could be difficult to get get it all onto one farm. Well, and that seems to be the big distinction from the oil and gas boom we saw. You had to get a lot of landowners in southeast Ohio to be able to pool all those resources, whereas now you can go get one large farm and... Hope to just deal with that one farm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Right. So. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if yeah. there's a number they won't go below. I yeah. mean, I wondered if, you know, you could say, well, I don't want to do this many acres. I still want to farm this part of it. Or mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're going to want to try to get that. Now, I saw a few projects that were spread out hmm. uh, a lot more than I would expect, but I would think they'd want to try to get it as you know efficient as possible, that footprint. Hmm. But... I guess we'll learn more about that as we look more at how they do actually develop these things. Yeah, and we have a lot of other points that we tried to make. There's there's a long list of things that we would be looking at that farmland owners should be considering. So we've touched on that a lot in our blog. Uh, we've had two blog posts so far, and we'll be coming out with a law bulletin here soon that goes through even more questions, but then we'll also have a comprehensive uh, farmland owners guide to solar leasing here soon so right that'll yeah, be this really summer helpful. yeah it's another national project we're doing for the national ag law center but uh, we've been allowed to focus this one on ohio so uh, looking at ohio it should be useful for other states as well but it, it, we're really writing it for ohio farmland owners who are thinking about leasing so a lot of interesting issues there yeah, that is <laughs> kind of snuck up on us a little bit too. Right, right. Out Hemp blue, and solar power. Like. Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah. When you hear stories about when some of these wind farms went in, people were really excited. This was an opportunity to improve your land, and then we started seeing a trend where farms with windmills were selling for less than farms without them. So this is definitely something to put some serious thought into, even if your gut thought is, you know, this is a great investment, mm -hmm. a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. really think hard about some of these other questions. Right, and we, we do raise uh, the question of, you know, your community, your neighbors, what, you know, how does this affect them? Because, as Evan said, there's a construction easement, there's a, it's a pretty serious construction project for, how long did Eric say those could take to put those projects in? A few months. So we've, we've similar to what we saw with shale, you know, trucks and construction mm -hmm. traffic and um, a lot of that going on. So how will that affect your neighbors and your community? And we're also hearing a little bit about communities that don't want these, although they're certainly a lot less visible than the wind turbines. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, they, they can be actually difficult to see, you know, if, if there are certain um, elements in the landscape blocking them from a distance so mm -hmm. but still we're hearing that some some people don't want them in the area um i'm not sure why Do you, have you heard what some of the objections are to these glare is one although wow. there's there's disagreement over whether there is really much glare right but yeah. what other reasons have you heard on why people don't want them um it seems to distort like some of the benefits of having farmland close by yeah. like whether that be people living on that farm or the production that comes from that farm like whether it's like sales taxes and whatnot you lose out on that revenue mm -hmm. um, these don't really create that many on the ground jobs long term after construction mm -hmm. and aside from cleanup um, so you don't really get those ripple effects that you would get if something we're staying on the ground and creating jobs. It's not a factory. And I could see like from a farmland preservation mm -hmm. aspect too. Yeah. I mean, eventually it could be returned to farmland, but in what condition, like we just talked about, because it's going to take a lot of acres out of production potentially in some of these communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at the same time, it's not really conservation land. Like. Most of them get grassed over, but it's all mowed still. So it's mm -hmm. it, not a lot of them are becoming like wildlife. wildlife. Yeah. Yeah, so. they're not suited for, for 
wildlife. Although some are trying to do some work with pollinator habitat. Oh. But, yeah. um, there, there was a story recently of a raccoon, was it, that got into one and... Salinas caused, Municipal. Um, caused, that's what it was. Okay. Yeah. Caused some problems, right? Yeah, the, it shut down the facility for a while. I'm not oh sure goodness. how long it took to get back up or if it's back up. So they didn't want a lot of wildlife <laughs> in there, um, yeah. tottering around amongst the panels. So they're they're fenced in, and that I guess oh. when we think about from an aesthetic viewpoint, you know, you could have fencing, you could you could see the panels. It could be certainly less mm-hmm. pleasing to look at than farmland. So. We expect there could be some community concerns with it, but not exactly the point that you were making, Elizabeth, about what value does it, or how does it affect the value of your land itself. Yeah, Yeah, that's a good question. And the value of your neighbor's properties. and So those are issues to grapple with, difficult ones. Yeah, certainly be keeping an eye on it as it unfolds across Ohio. And we should mention, I, I was telling you this earlier, Amanda, about it's, it seems to be there's a lot of activity in southwest Ohio right now. So those landowners are getting postcards and, um, you know, hey, are you interested in leasing? And when you look at the map, you'll see that the development itself is focused largely in southwest Ohio with the exception of Hardin County. And that, we've learned, is because they're, southwest Ohio gets better sun. <laughs> a little bit. It's not a huge difference, but a little bit better sun. And then they also have good proximity to transmission. And so the activity seems to be going that way initially. But we've been assured that it can happen anywhere in Ohio. We've got, some, we've got good enough sun okay. in Ohio. <laughs> It has not felt like it lately. <laughs> yeah, well, it hasn't. It has not. So we'll see what happens. So let's talk about Roundup. You said there's a new litigation on the table with Roundup. A new decision, a new decision. that came oh, okay. out. Yes, we've been following that as well. And again, the, see these unexpected topics we get to talk about? <laughs> Uh, would we have thought we'd be talking about decisions um, that are awarding damages to plaintiffs who claim that that they've been harmed by glyphosate and then it causes cancer and it's caused physical harm to them. So the last case, what was the big verdict in that one? Two billion dollars. Oh my goodness. Was the jury award to uh, a couple. What's that? Couldn't, aren't they thinking about Oh, it, it's yeah. being... Lowering, lowering that. Yeah, Bear is going to try to get that not only reduced, but struck. So the first the first one that caused shockwaves was a quarter billion dollars. Um, that was a, a high school like maintenance man who took care of the lawns. In California? Yeah. Okay. All three of these so far have been in California. Oh, okay. Um, so that one, he received a quarter billion dollar jury award. That was reduced to under $100 million. And then... The second one happened in California State Court and got about $90 million, 80 to $90 million. Um, that was also reduced a little bit. But then this third one just blew both of those out of the water. Um, each, it was a couple, a, a husband and wife, that said they've been using Roundup for like 30 years just for personal reasons. And the, the jury gave them each a billion dollars and compensatory damages, or I'm sorry, punitive damages to punish what was Monsanto but is now owned by Bayer. Um, so that, that will likely be reduced, but the fact that it happened still caused shockwaves. Mm-hmm. And those are just three examples, and there are over 13,000 lawsuits currently pending across the United States. Yeah, that, now, you it, can't even watch TV anymore without a commercial. Seeing some ad. of the, the class action la- ads. I got a for, Facebook targeted ad last week. Really? But, it's because you've been Googling it. So well, much. I know, but still, like, <laughs> that, that means that people are there. These attorneys are trying to find plaintiffs to go after and get this chunk of the pie. But all three of those are already on appeal. So Bear is contesting the science behind it. So do we see a John Grisham novel coming out? <laughs> I think it's possible. It is. And that, you know, it's interesting that there's 
there's a lot of debate over the science. Yeah. And they're finding some ways to get through to those jurors and convince them that the science that you know we've been told for so long suggests that there aren't any harmful effects, that they're, they're finding some cracks in that. What do you think is a compelling argument? Have you? I think the first argument that? is that all three of these were in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so when you think of, I know it, it, everyone kind of jokes out in the Midwest that everything in California can cause cancer, according to the state of California. But I think the interesting case is going to be the St. Louis one that we're going to see coming up later this fall. That's mm-hmm. It's not... California. <laughs> exactly. So we'll, we'll have to see what convinces them. But mm-hmm. this it reminds me a little bit, in our class we talk about the McDonald's uh, hot coffee case mm-hmm. and what convinces the juries there. This seems to be, um, some of the jurors are saying, we don't like these big businesses coming in um, with their attitude and expectation that we're right and you're wrong. So it's it's really kind of a just an image perception. Yeah. Whenever you get punitive damages like that, you know that... You've done the, something to the, make the jury mad. Right. Yeah. They're feeling a need for justice. So what is that all about? Um, we'll see. Yeah. How well a jury, or if a jury in Missouri reacts in the same way as a California jury has. Yeah. But then there's the World Health Organization. We were talking about that mm-hmm. earlier because they've said they've said it could be cancer causing. Yes. Yeah, possibly so, carcinogenic. Right. Yeah. yeah. But didn't they say that about bacon? <laughs> well, exactly. So that's there's yeah there's disagreement. Well, and part of the. The issue that Bear is running up against is these plaintiffs' attorneys are saying, yeah, you have all this science from like the US EPA and then all this other research backed, but they're in your pockets. You're a big corporation, you're funding this research, and these juries have not liked that. It, it kind of stuck with them. Could be partially true, I mean. Yeah, I mean. And I, on the other hand, we have, I, mean, I know the janitor, I saw pictures of him, I mean, mm-hmm. he was certainly Affected by something. Yeah, I mean, all so of these. That's compelling. And it's all been the same. Not Hodgkin's mm-hmm. lymphoma so far. So all of these plaintiffs had cancer, um, and they just happened to be able to convince a jury that it was caused, at least in part, by Roundup or the glyphosate in Roundup. Yeah, that's no, just so tough because, you know, as trained scientists, we've learned that you know, science is never definitive. And yeah. you can get a lot of evidence towards an answer, but you will never absolutely 100% prove that that's the right answer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you look at something as common as Roundup has been over the last 20 years. If you buy it off the shelves at Walmart. Mm-hmm. It's going to be hard to find someone with cancer who at some point in their life didn't come in contact with Roundup. This is, it's just a, I think this is just a fascinating situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned something that I think is fascinating, 20 years, 30 years. We're now that far into it. Point. So is the science wrong, or is it just that we're at a different place in time? And, and do, do, do we have new science as to all the factors that are in place right do now? Up on it. Yes. Yeah. But we declared yes. it as the safest chemical so early that, I mean, how are you ever going to tease out correlations? Exactly. Well, but then even another question is, okay, if it does, what do we replace it with? <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what I'm wondering. Yes. Like, if this does turn out to be widespread decision and it's banned from use, I mean, is that what we're looking at potentially? I mean, long-term impacts could be huge for farmers. Well, be. bears' stock prices have been very hard hit following these decisions because their stockholders are looking and saying we have billions of dollars of damages coming up and we're not that big of a company Mm -hmm. it's it's a multi-billion dollar company but when you're talking about all these billion dollars of damages it's a lot Um, so it it begs the question of does bear survive this wow might be regretting that purchase right now (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting timing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yes, it is. 
but just a few cases and it, you know these could be outliers that's possible too that's why I'm waiting to see what happens in st. Louis that was Monsanto's former home so that's that's mm -hmm. why that case was brought there mm -hmm. and there is always you know we talk a lot in the law about that sensitive plaintiff that you can get that is just super sensitive and different than everyone else predisposed to it yeah we we don't know how much of that could be going on so I think there's still a lot more science <laughs> yet to come yeah it just gets so messy when it's you know, tangled up in the emotions and jury reactions mm -hmm. yeah unfortunately we're we're the Juris doctors, not the medical doctors. <laughs> we can only talk to you about the law. <laughs> well, thank you guys very much. This was a lot of interesting and good information. Law is fun. Yeah, we're <laughs> never at a loss for issues to mull over and follow. Yeah, and you guys have great resources with your blog, so we'll be sure to link your blog. Mm -hmm. So if you want more details about anything we talked about or tons of other topics. Oh, thank you. The The solar leasing guide will be on there. The national report we just did on ag nutrients is on there. Um, the information about our solar leasing workshop, or solar leasing 101. Uh, we try to put everything on that blog website, which is part of the farm office website. Mm -hmm. Yep, and yes. you can subscribe to that too so you get updates whenever you guys post something, which is nice. All right, well, thanks again, and we'll have to have you back soon. All right, thanks. Thanks for listening to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. Join us again in two weeks for our next episode.